turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness saw through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. Cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of Kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my Death has lost.
Encourage, encourage you to lift up your praise and your worship to God this morning because He is so, so worthy of our praise. Amen. Set me free from death to life You're the ever 
Well, good morning. You may be seated. Great to see you. So uh, we're, uh, I was wondering how many would come today with the, um, the uh, new uh, COVID things that are going on around the community. But um, just keep yourselves safe. And I don't want to rave on about COVID. We hear it all the day. It drives you crazy. But um, just, uh, you know, keep your distances. Clean your hands. If you do shake someone's hand, don't touch your face. And Give it a clean, there's plenty of stuff around and all of that. So all good. So welcome today. And uh, Pastor Derek's going to be preaching today. So that'd be good. And I think we're going to do communion at the very end. We've got these little sealed things. So we're into the new year, 2022. And uh, I believe for High Street Church, 2022 is going to be a year of increase. And I'm believing for that. And uh, so we'll go for that. So that'll all, all be good. So that's the announcements. And I don't think we've got any guests or anything happening. We're just going month to month. Welcome to those watching via live stream this morning. God bless you. And uh, welcome today. And um, hi, Nita. And, uh, and uh, Sean and Leah and... Uh, We've got a few sick people, <laughs> but um, all's good. All right. Um, what are we going to do now? The uh, tithes and offerings, is it? And um, we do that. And again, thank you, everyone, that contributes electronically. Um, in the centre there, there's the number. And uh, it's uh, really been good keeping the church active and alive. And as you know, we don't only want your money. That's not what we're here for. We're here to preach Jesus and the gospel. But we thank you that um, that's how we survive and carry on and people give. Uh, giving envelopes are also up the front if anyone wants to do over and above their tithes any special offerings to any of our missionaries we help support. 
up on the back wall there. There are some others we help support. We also help support local missionary, Dr. Wayne Williams. Uh, they had uh, 640 something commitments last week out on the streets again. They're just always out, even with Wayne in America. <laughs> the team are out there praying. So, fantastic. So, let's have a look. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So, what's the tithe? A tithe is 10%, and a storehouse is your local church where you fellowship. Um, so, that's, I won't go into a teaching on it. And Deuteronomy, the Lord will command a blessing on you. So, the main thing about tithes and blessings is I think we're blessed to be a blessing. And when we learn to give and when we learn to give to the work of God, God blesses us back uh, in many ways. And I could tell you story after story, and I'm sure you could too. And, you know, that's where our heart is. So let's stand up and do that. And um, now, as I always say, tithes and offerings are not mandatory, okay? If... Um, uh, people, we're not. Uh, we're just uh, happy that you're here, and um, you got the backside on the seat there, and you're learning the Word of God, and you're learning about Jesus, and that's the most important thing to us. But um, it does take money to run that. <laughs> uh, actually, we're all pretty good here. None of us. Um, just to let you know, none of our uh, preachers or staff are on are being paid. Um, we do get some um, remission for fuel and a few things but none of us are on a wage so we do what we do we do volunteer but that doesn't mean that um we couldn't be paid you know there's nothing wrong with the the so uh you know it, 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 it's okay to pay someone full time it's not a wrong thing but um uh we don't we don't do that here at the moment because we've got a lot of good volunteers so let's say this together as I give in today's offering, I stand on the word of God and believe the promise that as I sow my seed, God will water and multiply it according to his greatness and goodness. I believe the principle of multiplication can be released over my life beginning today. Amen. So with the basket out the front, so if um, those that still bring cash or would like to do that this morning, um, don't run forward, but... Uh, walk forward and we'll do that as the uh, worship team lead us into some worship this morning God bless
Well, bless the Lord. You may be seated. So um, I'm just going to ask Helen, to, before Derek preaches, to pop forward. And um, I think we're praying, was it two weeks last week or the week? Last week, um, we we're praying for healing for people. And if you got healed, come and tell me because it's a good testimony when God heals someone. And... Um, uh, Maria's had a healing too, haven't you? Just come forward a minute. I might, just before we start, just feeling led to just to uh, do that. Thanks, guys. So what what happened last week, Helen? Well, I've had this trouble with... <laughs> I've had trouble with this knee for a long, long time. <laughs> and it's been very crippling. And when we had prayer last week for healing for anyone that had anything wrong with them, it happened. It's healed. It doesn't trouble me. Um, it hasn't come back, has it? No. She keeps coming to me and telling me that a knee. How long did you have that for? Oh, months. Broke back for 12 months. Amen. And it was God just healed her in a seat. Well, we, we declared it and we declared healing over people. Maria, uh, Maria's had a, a healing too. I don't know where to start it. <laughs> God had been so good to me. God had been so good to me, but uh, two years ago I was supposed to be dead, but here I am. I am alive and kicking. <laughs> I was supposed to have, well, cancer, breast cancer. And um, yeah, anyway, they wanted to take everything out, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, that particular morning, I got up and I usually do my devotion. And here I find a, a, a passage just for me in the Bible, which is Psalm 30, verse 2. I, know, I don't remember much of it. I remember the contents, but not the specific slides. But it 
he said to me, well, I think it was Bene, I cry unto you, Lord, and you heal me. And I thought, God, what am I doing? I, <laughs> my son was getting ready for himself because he's supposed to go to hospital about seven that morning. And I said, I'm not going to have it. Mom, it's your choice. I took you everywhere because, you know, scan and all this was a quite a, a journey. But now it's your choice. I said, look, God's been so good to me. I'm supposed to be paralyzed. 30 years ago, I had a bad car accident. Uh, and really, if they operated on me, they were put me on a wheelchair. But anyway, I thought, well, God, you're the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I trust in you. I am healed with your blood. Amen. And here Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. My doctor told me yeah, I was sure. stupid to go and have the operation. I told her, no. I'm not stupid. I think I've got the same because I believe in God and He healed me before and He healed me again. Amen. And she says, Well, if you had the operation, you could live, you know, maybe a year or two, but like that. She said, No, it doesn't matter. Just go to a better place. Don't die. Who cares? Don't <laughs> <laughs> go to the Lord. <laughs> How old are you now, man? 81 and a half. <laughs> 81 and a half. I just Give her a hand. Two. <laughs> she looks about 60. <laughs> oh, thank you. But sometimes, you know, I feel good, really. I really feel great. It, sometimes it, age is just a number. Oh, yeah. Amen. It's how we feel, and God is with us, Amen. and we move. And that's the only thing I can say. So keep on. Be faithful. Don't give up. Whatever situation you have, because God is with us. Twenty more years. Thanks, Lady. That's all right. <laughs> we, um, so um, just to um, let you know too, share the word from God. So I believe in doctors. I believe in God. And um, so I think I've saved a few lives. I said go and get to the doctor um, and get some help. And God uses doctors too. But she's had a word from God and God has healed her. It's wonderful. So make sure you got a word from God if you go down that track, okay? <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Derek. Give him a big hand. <laughs> thanks very much, Jess. Yeah, thanks, um, worship team. That was a great... Is that a new song that we sang a bit earlier on? But yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. That was good. You know, these guys do wonders. Um, haven't been able to practice much for, for COVID reasons, but they, they come and they lead us in worship and they do a fantastic job. And we thank you. Thank you to the whole of the worship team. Uh, not just the ones that we hear today, but there's a, a few others that are, uh, are on a roster. So thanks to Jess for keeping them all fired up and gung ho. So it's good. So um, welcome to church. My message this morning is Are You Hungry? Okay. Uh, I'm not because I've had Christmas, and <laughs> but. But my hungry is is not is not something to do with food. Okay, so uh, let's just let get that straight. It's got nothing to do with food. All right. Well, today my message is coming is coming from the Gospel of Mark. It's also coming from Matthew and a bit from Luke and a bit from a few other places as well. So a bit of a smorgasbord, but uh, hopefully you'll get the gist of what I want to say. Um, so I read this passage and I, you know, there's a few things I find very interesting in this passage of scripture. It's, um, it's about the baptism of, of Jesus, basically. Okay, so John the Baptist is, is out in the wilderness, okay, so he's miles away from anywhere in the wilderness. He's a bit of a, uh, what? I don't know how you would describe him, I suppose. You know, he wear, wore rough clothes. He ate honey and locusts, so probably never had a haircut in his life. Uh, not sure how much he was into bathing and all that kind of stuff. So he was a pretty wild creature. Probably, you know, Bear Gryllis on, on steroids, I don't know. But anyway. but he, he was preaching a message that everybody came out to hear, Okay. He said the people from his, uh, from Jerusalem and all around Judea came to him to hear his message and his preaching and his baptism. So he was, people were hungry. You know? You've got to remember um, 
there's a 400 year gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. God had been silent for a long time. Then along comes John, who's a prophet, and he's preaching this message. And, and people are hungry. People are hungry to hear the word of God. Okay? And it, it didn't matter, you know, where it was. They, they went. Okay? And, and, you know, there's no motor cars. There's no trains. There's no planes. There's no buses. You want to get somewhere in those days, you walked. Okay, so people were desperate to hear the word of God and they walked to where he was in the wilderness. And, you know, and that's something that we need to, you know, put away in our little heads. You know, if we had to walk to church today, how many would have come? Would you have come if you had to walk? It's a question that you need to answer, uh, you know, be honest with yourself, okay? We are <laughs> very much uh, a society where comfort is paramount, you know, uh, and I'm just as much to blame as anything, you know, my, my kids go camping, you know, they go down the coast and they go to a, a campsite that's got nothing, basically. Uh, my idea of camping is a four-star hotel uh, at uh, Manly or somewhere like that, overlooking the beach. Now that's, you know, I used to take the kids camping when I was younger. Okay. Um, a lot younger. Uh, and we used to go in the Blue Mountains and we'd spend the weekend just tramping through the Blue Mountains with a group of kids and all that kind of stuff. And it was good fun. But now, no. Four stars or nothing. Okay, so there you go. So, but these are the things that we need to sort of come get around us. You know, if if things get difficult to come to hear the word of God, would we come? That's the thing. Would we come? So, Mark account starts off with him referencing the prophet Isaiah about the coming of John, preparing the way for for the Lord, and this was John's message in chapter 1 verse 7 and it's this was he says and this was his message after me comes the one more powerful than I the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to, to stoop down and untie I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and the thing I found fascinating in that one is that John says that he is unworthy to undo the straps of Jesus sandals and this is what Jesus said about John this is in Luke's gospel chapter 7 verse 28 I tell you among those born of women there is no one greater than John yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him so Jesus is sort of telling people that John is a is, is a good prophet he's a great prophet He's lifting him up. But John declared that he was unworthy to undo the sandals, the straps of Jesus' sandals. Now, why is that so fascinating? Well, in the day of Jesus, the custom was that if you uh, visited somebody, the lowliest servant, okay, the absolute bottom of the pile, his job was to wash your feet. Now, remembering in those days, there's no, um, there's no sanitation, okay, so there's no sewer, all right, there's no uh, nice concrete pathway, okay, it's all dirt and dust. You wore open toe sandals. So you were walking in the dirt and the dust, and and, and have a guess what else was uh, was around? Lots of smelly stuff. You know, these days, if you take your dog down the park, you have to take a little bag with you to pick up the dog. Okay, not in those days. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> come on, mum, you got to run a bit quicker. <laughs> 
You'll be right. Okay. Second lap. Where are you guys? Okay. Yeah, we should never, never compete with children. It's, it's you're on a, you're on a downer. There, you're no way you're going to win. But where was I? Yes. Okay. So back in those days, uh, you know, the, the animals just did what they did, whatever they were. And nobody went around with a spade and cleaned it all up. So you can imagine what your feet were like at the end of the day. To say that they were smelly is probably an understatement. But see, this is what Jesus does in the Gospel of John chapter 13 from verse 12. It says this, When he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now that's a message or speak. Jesus speaking to his disciples. Who are you? What are you? You are disciples of Christ. Now, if he's telling his disciples back then what to do, what do you think he's telling you? And me, okay? I'm not just, uh, the old thing is when you point a finger, there's, you've got to remember there's you know, at least three pointing back at you. So, you know, stop pointing fingers. But that's where you are. You are the disciples of Christ. So when he's teaching or telling his disciples how they should behave, he's telling you and me how to behave. So Jesus taught his disciples by his actions. So actions speak louder than words. There's an old saying. You can say all sorts of wonderful things. But if your actions don't back up your words, then you are just a noisy gong. Okay? You are nothing. Okay? If you say you love people, but you hate your brother, <laughs> then you're a hypocrite. Sorry about that, but that's the way it is. You see, this is what Jesus said in Mark 9, verse 35. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. And the servant of all. You know, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, there's something you've got to learn. You've got to learn to be a servant. Okay? You, look, there, there is no ifs, buts, or ands. You don't get to the top of the tree unless you start at the bottom and work your way up. You know? As a public servant, um, I started at the bottom and worked my way up. But uh, as I, as the years rolled on, I saw quite a lot of uh, uh, graduates. Uh, Defence had this graduate program, and they would come in and they'd be very young, and they'd be they'd expect to be uh, ill ones the day after they uh, they arrived. Sadly, half of them. Oh, some of them probably were pretty good, but some were a little less, and, and they weren't happy to be taught. So you've got to be a, a servant. You've got to be, you've got to be prepared to do the hard yards, okay, and not just start right at the top. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> if you uh, knew what Wayne had to put up with, you wouldn't want to be starting off at the top. <laughs> yes, we're still at work. Well, we're all. But see, 
Matthew records or goes on to record what occurred after Jesus was baptized. Uh, chapter 1 verse 10 says this, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. A couple of things caught my eye in this or got my attention. First thing was that it said heaven was torn open. Okay, now, if you tear something, it's not just a simple, you know, you, you, you've got to give it a bit of oomph. I was going to bring in a piece of cloth and, and try and demonstrate it, but then I thought, no, you better not because, you know, you might not be able to tear it. It would look a bit silly, wouldn't I, if I was trying to tear it and I couldn't do it. So I thought, no, I better not. I could have got Jack to do it, though. He, he'd, he'd have been able to. But no, okay. Yeah, well, this is it. Oh, well, yeah, I was going to cut it with a pair of scissors first. So, so make it, but anyway, but if you get my drift, you see, this is, if you've got to picture it, you know, if you can picture it in your, in your mind, this is something, God is making a statement. All right, and it's not just a, excuse me, people, I, I just want to get your attention. It's, hey, Luke, hey, look. This is, I'm telling you something. Pay attention. Only a bit louder than that. You know, when God speaks, you know it, okay? So God is making a statement. He's saying to everybody who was there. And they, it was so uh, impression on them that they wrote it down. That God made a visit and he tore heaven open and then what else does it say you know I tried to find a picture of you know heaven being torn open and and, and all I could find was um, little lights flying coming out of the clouds and a little dove fluttering, fluttering down and that's not the picture I get but then again but that's what mostly is what I could find so at the end of the day I gave that one away so the second thing that, that caught my attention, he said, you are my son with wh whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So well, with what was God well pleased? <laughs> you know, at this point of time, Jesus' had ministry had not even started. He basically hadn't done anything. Okay, if you read through scriptures, you find that um, ministry in, in Jesus' day began at 30 years of age. Now, that is, you can find that in Numbers chapter 4, verse 3. And then it's confirmed by Luke in chapter 3, verse 23, when Luke recounts the genealogy of Jesus. And he said that Jesus started his ministry around the age of 30. So, what was God pleased with? Well, to find out about that, you've got to go back again into Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 49 to 52. And this is, uh, you remember, uh, well, hopefully you remember, that uh, his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year. And on his 12th year, they went to Jerusalem, to the temple. And they were going home. And uh, three days or a couple of days or whatever it was, they looked for him and couldn't find him. And they realized he wasn't with the troop going home, so they went back to Jerusalem. And it took them three days to find him. And on the third day, they found him in the temple. And this is what he said. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You see, what God was pleased with is that Jesus 
took time to learn stuff. He took the time to learn who he was, what he was here for, what he had to do. And he also learned how to interact with people. Okay? As a carpenter's son, um, you know, a, a carpenter not, you know, I guess working with his hands had a lot to do with people in the village making making their uh, uh, seats, chairs, whatever, fixing their wooden plows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but he'd learned how to talk to people, how to interact with people. It was a learning curve. He was hungry to learn these things. You see, it's important to understand that to do something for God takes time. You know, there's a... Uh, an overnight success can take 30 years. Jesus was an overnight success, but it took him 30 years. Okay, um, I'm no overnight success, so I'm getting on. It's my birthday on Wednesday, but I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> See, it takes time. Sometimes God has to knock off the rough edges. You know, because we're all diamonds in the rough. And God sometimes polishes us up. And, 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 and you know, if you know anything about diamonds, uh, you might get a big diamond, and at the end of the day you get something, you know, because they cut off all the bad stuff. All the bad stuff gets cut off. And, and that's what God does to us. He cuts off all the bad stuff. Sometimes he leaves stuff on. Sometimes we need to be have some rough stuff left on so that we can relate to people. You know, there's an old saying, I suppose, you know, you, um, you're so heavenly minded or spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. Though sometimes you need to have a little bit of uh, rough stuff left on you so you can relate to people. See, the things that you go through in life you can relate to people. Somebody else going through that, they can look at you and go, how did you get through that? Well, I got through it because Jesus got me through. How did you do that? Well, God healed me or whatever it might be. But it allows you to have this um, uh, or to, you know, to be uh, fed income with people if you want an Australian uh, saying. You know, be fed income. You see... The biggest thing that God wants from us, though, is, is a relationship. He wants us to take the time to build that relationship. Because the relationship we have with Jesus or with God is going to make us resilient. Okay, that's a big word. That one just came to me. It's not in my notes, that one. <laughs> but resilient. Okay, so we, we, we have resilience because we need to be able to bounce back from things because life isn't always fun life as one famous prime minister said life wasn't meant to be easy said he from his million dollar mansion but it's true life isn't meant to be easy and as a christian you do you get no freebies okay there's no free run just because you become a Christian. You're a Christian, <laughs> it probably goes through the other way. It probably means that you're up for more um, hassles in life. Um, family, friends, when you become a Christian, think you've gone cr nuts. You're crazy. What's the matter with you? I've got freedom. I have peace. Oh, might be turmoil going on but inside I've got perfect peace I know my God's in control I don't I don't have to worry about what's going to happen I just say oh, okay God you're in control you've got my plan you know every day of my life from beginning to end and I, I got no idea I don't know what I'm doing in two minutes from now I don't even know what sometimes what I'm going to say next <laughs> anything else so you know but God is in control 
And so it was good. You see, being hunger for God means that you are, are willing to be taught. A good one is Moses. Now Moses spent 40 years being taught by the wisest men in Pharaoh's court. Okay? So he, was, he, he wasn't an illiterate. Okay, he, he was well taught. He was the, 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 like, you know, the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Adopted, of course, but that she sort of overlooked all that kind of stuff. But he would have been taught by the greatest minds of that time. And he spent 40 years in Pharaoh's court. Then he spent 40 years herding sheep. Interesting, because I know, because I've been out to Stan's farm a while back and we were trying to get the sheep to go where we wanted them to go. Good job we had some dogs, because if we hadn't had the dogs, uh, we would have still been herding sheep. Because they just don't, they just, they don't want to do what you wanted them to do. They just, oh, I'm going to go over here. And, no, no, I don't want, come over, no, no, I want to go over there. I wouldn't say they're stupid, but they're pretty close to it. They got their own thing. But see, but he spent 40 years learning how to get sheep to go where he wanted them to go. And then he spent 40 years with the sheep of Israel, getting them to go where they wanted to go. So, I, you know, I think the 40 years herding sheep probably helped him a lot more than the 40 years in Pharaoh's court. But... Uh, you know, Israel were a stubborn people. So, you know, I got a little thing here that says, uh, all you up-and-coming young leaders, don't be in a rush to fulfill what you think is your calling. You know, God's timing in all things is perfect. Ours isn't. There's an old saying that says you've got to learn to crawl before you can walk. And that is true in ministry as in most things in life. Now, going on with the story in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4 verses 1, we see what uh, happens after Jesus has come up out of the water, the Spirit uh, has descended on him like a dove. And then it says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Wow. You, know, you see, the Spirit, with a big capital S, so it's the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, hang on a minute. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere, because I'm no encyclopedia when it comes to where things are in the, in, in the Bible. I, I, I need a concordance and I need a... Uh, 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 an app on my phone that lets me ask all sorts of different questions. So I say, I know there's a scripture there somewhere. And there is. James chapter 1 verse 13 tells us that God does not tempt anyone. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Okay, it's your own doing. It's your own doing. But then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So God doesn't tempt us. So, what does that passage mean? So I got my good friend Google, and I thought, well, we'll have a look at this, and I found this article by a doctor, Dan Hayden. Now, he, gave, he gives a fairly in-depth explanation, and it goes on for quite some time. So, but he's very good. He, he sort of comes to the crux of it all. And uh, the short, I, I copied a bit from it. And it, it all relates to this Greek word, and forgive me, you Greek scholars, because I don't know if this is how you pronounce it, but it's perizo, perizo. Set up with a 
And it can be used in two senses, and in two two particular ways. And this is how, how we explain it. Part of the answer to these questions lie in the meaning of the word tempted, as found in the New Testament. It is the Greek word, as I've said, which can be used in two senses. Sometimes it is used to refer to temptation with evil or enticement to sin. For instance, in Galatians 6 verse 1, it says, Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one look into yourself, lest you be tempted. Okay, so that's the word perizo. So here he says, tempted is, is in parallel with the word trespass, which is a reference to sin. This is the way we normally think of the word tempted. We are tempted to sin. But the second way of looking at it is this. It says, uh, in the scripture, sometimes it is simply refers to a, a trial or a test. Sin is not the object here, but rather an opportunity to prove one's character or intent. Okay, so your character will be under pressure. Okay, as I said, it's, you know, your actions speak louder than words. So your character comes out of your actions. Uh, so this is what, and the, um, the, the uh, example he uses is in Hebrews 11 verse 17. And it says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, again it's that Greek word, offered up Isaac. Now God was not trying to get Abraham to sin. He was giving Abraham an opportunity to prove his unwavering trust in God's promise to him okay so you remember what God had told Abraham that he would have uh, you know his his descendants would be greater than the stars greater than the sand on the seashore okay and he gave him one son and a promise one son and a promise and then God said take your son up to the mountain and sacrifice him but God had given him a promise. So what was Abram going to do? Well, he was going to do what God told him to do and believe the promise. And because he did what he was told and believed the promise, God gave him the goat. Now, was that difficult? My oath, it was a bit difficult. Could you do it? I don't know. But God gave him a son, gave him a promise. And, Mo, and he believed. Abraham believed it. Now, if you believe the promises God has said to you or about you, then God will fulfill those promises. He will. You've been, if you've had a prophecy over your life, then God will fulfill that prophecy. It might take a little while, but God will do it. You've got to remember how old was Abraham when he was told he was going to have a son. He said, oh, get real. You know? and, and, and my wife, well, she's even you know, worse than I am. So how are you going to do that? But God said, don't, don't, don't. Don't question what I've said, just believe. And he did, and it happened. So, in the context of the passage that we've just read about Jesus being laid out and being tempted, the, the, a more accurate description, I think, is that he was tested. He was tested. You know, there's a few people, Job, for instance. Now, Job was tested. Okay, he wasn't tempted so much as tested. He had he had a good life, didn't he? He had sons and daughters. He had lots and lots of animals. Lots. He was rich. Probably one of the richest people in the world at the time. He was rich. But the devil said he won't worship you if you take it all away. If it all goes away, he won't worship you. And God said, okay, you can take it all away, but you can't kill him. But you can take it all away. So what happened to poor old Job? He lost everything. 
lost all his kids, lost all his animals, lost all his wealth. He had boils, he had all sorts of things. He had, it was terrible. But he never cursed God. And what at the end of the day, God gave him back double. He gave him back double. He got double what he said. Yeah, so, you know, regardless of the situation, believe what God has said. And the situation will turn around. Not as quickly as we would like sometimes, but it will turn around. And this is, um, we read in, in, uh, in, in Matthew, after Jesus has been in the, in the desert to fasted for 40 days he said the devil the tempter the devil came to him and said if you are the son of god tell these stones to become bread jesus answered it is written man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of god then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple if you are the son of god he said throw yourself down for it is written he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift up, uh, lift you up in their hands uh, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. Some, uh, some of the scriptures said that the devil left him for a more opportune time. Okay, so we see in all of that that the devil is testing Jesus. He's testing Jesus' faith. He's testing his understanding of scripture. Because there's one thing that's clear, the devil knows scripture. He knows scripture, but he just simply misinterprets it to suit his own purposes. Okay, he, he, he kind of twists it or, you know, kind of gives it a different context. That's why you should, when you're reading the Bible and, and listening to things, and you should always take it in context, okay? Uh, because you can take any scripture you like and you can turn it into whatever you like if you take it out of context. If you take it out of context, you can get scripture to uh, give you uh, a, uh, uh, or give credence to your way of life or your way of thinking because you twist what scripture says or you take it out of context. So you've got to be careful when you're listening to me or anybody else uh, that we don't take scripture out of context for you, that we give you the, the uh, best picture as we possibly can. So it's something that you should be aware of, something you should take precautions of. You can be assured that your knowledge or lack thereof of Scripture will be put to the test at some point in your walk with the Lord. See, being familiar with your tools of your trade is an essential requirement. See, when I was a service technician, quite some time ago now, but a long time ago, but when I was a service technician, um, I used to work for Simpson, okay, and uh, every time they brought out a, a new product, uh, as service technicians, we were all brought into the workshop, we were given a brand new machine, and we pulled it apart, and then we put it back together again, and hopefully it still worked, but yes, it did, most of the time, okay, so, but see, if you don't know what you're working on or what you're working with, then you, you can't fix it. And if you don't know the instruction manual, you can't fix it. And now, you know, most days these things these days don't come with instruction manuals. Um, as I found out the other day when I was trying to fix my modem at home. <laughs> there's no instruction manual. Even on the internet, there's no instruction manual. And, and the basic thing that comes on, it says plug it in, uh, turn it on, and, and stick your cables in the different, you know, make sure you put the yellow one in the yellow 
the yellow thing at the back. It's all colour coded, so you, so make sure you put the yellow on. It comes with a yellow cable. Make sure the yellow cable goes in. No. But as to fixing the thing, no, no idea. No way. So anyway, long story short, rang up Telstra, got on touch with some person. And you know what he said? Turn it off. <laughs> he said, go to the wall, just unplug it, wait two minutes, then plug it back in. Uh, okay. So I unplugged it, waited two minutes, plugged it back in, turned it back on. Hey, voila, it worked. Amazing. So I sent him back and said, you're a genius. He said, yes, I know. <laughs> I don't know who that person is, but he's got a good sense of humor. But anyway, so... You know, so it, it, it's the same, you know, in, in as I, my reference to my learning uh, as a service technician, it's the same with um, using scripture. If you don't know scripture, it's going to be of no use to you whatsoever. You know, I mean, it's nice to, you know, to have all these fancy giz gizmos and gadgets and all that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, you are going to need to know scripture. Because not it's you know what you've got is not always going to be available. Okay, as I found out, because because my modem wasn't working, my internet wasn't working. You know what the saddest part about that was? I couldn't watch the cricket. <sighs> oh, it was a terrible loss. It was a shocker. Yes, I can't stand Channel Seven because they got too many adverts. But anyway, never mind. Anyway, where was I? You see, in the passage that we've just read, you see that Jesus answered the devil with Scripture. He said, it is written. Now, he didn't argue. He didn't debate the fact, you know. He said, if you are the Son of God. Well, he didn't say, of course I am the Son of God. He didn't, he didn't debate. He knew. And he just said, it is written. It is written. He didn't debate the devil. And sometimes we do. We Sometimes we get into the, a debate on the devil about things. And, and uh, let me tell you this. Uh, if you start debating the devil, you're going to lose. And he's very good at debating. So if you start debating the devil, you're going to lose. Don't debate the devil. The word says you are a son of God. You are a son of God. That's in the story. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Right? You don't don't get into a, a, an argument with with him. It's, it's you're not going to win unless you use in scripture. He can't he he can't get around scripture. He can't debate it. He loses. Scripture says so. Wake up to yourself, devil. You're a lost cause. Go away. You see. I remember that uh, Jesus said, you know, after 40 days, he was hungry. Well, I remember, who remembers the old 48-hour uh, uh, famine, you know, uh, what was it? 40-hour um, famine uh, with um, uh, whoever it was, I can't remember now. But I, I, I tried it many, many, many years ago. Yeah, World Vision, that's it. Yeah, World Vision, 40-hour famine. And I tried it, and uh, um, yeah, I lasted 18 hours, oh, which was I thought was good. But I always put myself in hospital. <laughs> I had the wobbles, the shakes, and in hindsight, it's, it, it was, it's all, um, uh, it was all, uh, I had diabetes, didn't know it. It wasn't until much, much later that I got di diagnosed. But all those symptoms, shaking and wobbles and all that kind of stuff, that's all the symptoms of having a, a, a low sugar because I, all I had was water. So, you know, so you know, that was the end of any 40-hour famine. But Jesus, 40 days, 40 nights, and he was, um, <laughs> and he was hungry. Yeah, I'd be hungry too. But see, the thing is, in that statement, the thing that stands out is Jesus took 
he, he kept at it. He didn't give in. He was, you know, 40 days, 40 nights, and he went right through the whole thing. And I'm sure there's, uh, if you were to investigate the 40 hours, the 40 days, there's bound to be some great uh, meaning behind it. But uh, I put my hand up, I don't know. But all I know is a long time. You see, being persevering is and believing in God for to do his promises is, is most important. I've already spoken about Abraham and uh, his faith was tested, but he believed God and God provided the, the sacrifice that was required. And when you read Paul, uh, about Paul's life in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, he, he talks about the number of times he, f- he first faced death and persecution, the number of times he was stoned. Okay, now stoning in those days, you, they tossed bricks at you until you were dead. So he, he, somehow God revived him twice. And, so, and he was shipwrecked and he spent a day in the ocean and all those sort of things. So he, 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 but he persevered. And he says, at the end, he says that he ran the race. He'd run the race when he when he's uh, finally in the uh, prison in Rome, but he says that he'd he'd run the race. And in um, in in the book of Revelation, chapter two, verse ten, he says this. He says, "Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you." And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. It's um, it's a sobering thought, I guess, that um, Jesus tells us to prepare. We are going to, uh, yeah, you've got one. Batman's car. But, you know, it, it, G, Jesus is telling us to be prepared. You know, times will get tough. So be prepared. Be prepared with the word. No, understand that these things will happen. But at the end of it all, you are going to get the victor's crown. You are going to spend eternity in heaven. Where there's no tears, no pain. You know, you're walking on gold. You know, you're singing songs of praise to God all day long. You know, the the the. I, I don't know how you um, picture heaven in your own mind. What's it like for you? But it's perfect. Okay. Nothing, nothing like we've got here. And here's pretty good, I must admit, but nothing like heaven. Uh, Jess, can you? I'm nearly finished, and then I'm, gonna, then I'm going to uh, uh, just get communion. And we've got prayer as well. So do you want to do prayer before communion? Well, let me just finish with this, and then we'll get Annie up. See, being hungry for the Word of God will bring with it persecution and trials. But it also brings rich rewards to those who persevere. So are we committed to fully giving ourselves over to what God wants for us? You know, and I put my hand up here and I wrote it down. So I know for myself that at times I have fallen way, way, way short. I've allowed myself to do things other than what God wants me to do. But the thing I do know is that the grace of God allows me to come and have another go. And hopefully, he says, in hindsight, I've learned something and that I can come on and do something, do it a bit different, do it a bit different. 
bit different. A bit different. The ultimate catch cry of our lives should be never give up. Well said. Never give up. No matter what. You must persevere to the end and you will receive the crown of life. And you will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. question of persevering so it's my message for today are you hungry are you hungry for the word are you hungry to be where God is are you hungry to do whatever even if it's to wash people's smelly feet are you prepared to do that are you prepared to do what God is asking you to do whatever it might be I don't know, you might be the next Billy Graham for all I know. But are you prepared to do the hard yards that God, that God wants you to do? And it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are or anywhere in between. But are you prepared to do what God wants you to do? Hallelujah. So we'll get Annie up to do the prayers and then we'll do the... Well, bless God. Come on up, Annie. Before we uh, do that, um, we finish this morning. Um, grab a cup of coffee out there later if you like. And um, I might go down the mall for lunch if anyone's going down. We can um, have some fellowship down there. Um, just uh, addressing those watching via live stream, maybe watching this morning, Are You Hungry for God? A great message. And and um, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for God. I'm always hungry. And um, I just want to encourage you to be hungry and to, to be a God chaser. You know, I know you are because you're here. And, uh, but what we'd like to do is pray a prayer. Uh, you may be here this morning and um, you uh, may be seeking Christ. Or you may be watching by a live stream and seeking Christ, watching and wondering what it's all about. Well, my Bible says that if you confess with your mouth in the book of Romans and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. For well, with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made. And there are three things we really have to do is to believe in Jesus. Jesus is God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He's God the Son. And we need to um, receive him into our life and we need to turn from our sins. And I don't know about you, but I used to enjoy my sins, uh, the pleasure of sin, but used to bring bad results in my life. I was a drunk and a drug addict and everything else that goes. And I've never been happier for 40 years now I've been serving God and I learned about him and continue to learn and build that relationship and I'm hungry for him and I encourage you um, you know to continue on in that so I'd like to pray a prayer this morning and let it be a, a commitment um, I just saw a scripture there where Derek was preaching I might uh, share on I might share on that I've got another sermon done I get sermons everywhere but I, I really believe a year of increase and Jesus increased in favour uh, and stature uh, with God and with man. Jesus increased. Of course, he didn't have much favour with man at the end. His life was taken from him or he gave his life for us. Um, no one took it. He gave it. And uh, But he increased. And I think in our community, we need to increase in stature, uh, increase in favour with our community, uh, with people around us to love Jesus and point people to Jesus because that's really what we're all about. So let us bow our heads, and if we confess, let's speak it out, and um, let's believe it in our heart this morning. And if you do this sincerely, and you're watching by a camera, and do it sincerely, Jesus will come into your heart and sow a seed, and hopefully that'll be on good ground, not the wayside, where the birds of the air come, or, or where the thorns choke it out, but a good seed. Let's pray together. Uh, pray this out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in Jesus. I'm sorry for all my sins. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you, you conquered death. And through you, I can have eternal life after this life. And even it begins in this life. Lord, I invite you into my life now. Come into my heart. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Touch me with your presence and make yourself real to me. And I give you many thanks. I can just see the Spirit of God like a dove in a vision coming upon you. And see it in the Spirit like a gentle dove just coming upon you right here, right now, touching you, watering that seed and making it real. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And thanks for returning visions to me. I've been a bit dry lately. I'm starting to, the Lord's starting to do something new and fresh and old and new. So it's wonderful. God bless you all. And we're going to hand to Annie. And before we go, we're just going to pray for some church needs that um, you've put on off um, Facebook and uh, YouTube or wherever. And some needs that we've had for people. Can you add Mari Knight to that? She had a fall broke her hip but she's recovering okay so we'll uh, we'll pray for them and we'll open up the um the front area at the end so if you need to go that's good um if you need to come for prayer pastor Derek will be up here and a prayer team and a few of us um I might wander up the front and uh, they'll pray for any needs that you might have this morning thanks Annie praise the Lord let us stand reach out for these prayer request this morning thank you Jesus oh precious Jesus father as we come to you in Jesus name we pray Lord for um, Mark's sister Michelle Lord we declare healing for her foot Lord we pray Lord that um, you'll heal that foot and restore it Lord to good health thank you Lord we pray Lord for um, declaring the fullness of the kingdom for Bruce and his household father pray, Lord, that um, you'll do a mighty work in that household, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We declare um, healing for those who are sick and unwell this morning. Um, a number of church members are, um, are not well, Jesus. So we ask, Lord, for healing for um, Sean, Leah and the kids, Lord. We declare healing over them, Lord Jesus. We declare healing for Belinda, Lord, and Nita, Lord. We declare healing in your name, Lord, and we pray that you restore them to good health, Jesus. We pray for Joan, Lord. She's not well today, Lord, but Lord, you can raise her up and um, and you can um, heal her body, Lord, and restore it to good health, Lord. Strengthen them all, Jesus. Strengthen them, Lord. And we pray for Dom too, Lord. We pray for healing for Dom. We declare healing over Dom and, re and we pray, Lord, that you restore him to good health, Jesus. We also pray, Lord, for healing for um, Trish, Lord. Um, restore her to good health, Jesus. We pray, Lord, for Pastor Colin Freeman too, Lord. We declare healing, Lord. You are the miracle working God, Lord. You are our healer, Lord. And as we um, cry out to you this morning for these, for our loved ones, Lord, the church members, Lord, we pray that you restore them all to good health, Lord. We, we declare healing for Mari, Lord. Mary Knight, she's um, had a fall, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that um, her um, hip will be restored to good health, Jesus, and um, you will strengthen those hips, Lord Jesus, and restore it to good health. Thank you, Lord. And we um, pray for Daniel's friends too, Lord. We pray, Lord, that um, we um, pray, Lord, for Daniel as he ministers to his friends, Lord, that you will bless him, Lord. And um, he always thinks about his friends, Lord. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for salvation, Lord, for um, Daniel's friends, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, well, just before we go, um, does anybody via camera or even in a church here have a, a pain just below their knee, left knee here? Does anyone have that? If that's you, God will heal you this morning. 
Amen. No one putting their hand up. Don't be afraid. If that's you, God will heal you this morning. Well, I'll just pray. It could be someone via live camera. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray, even if it's someone here that hasn't um, put their hand up, we pray. Oh, it is you, Michael, is it? Just come forward, son. I'll pray for you. Bless you, mate. Just someone stand behind him, please. Just stand there, mate. Uh, how long have you had that for? Um, about eight years. Eight years. Where's it below the left knee? Okay. Whoa. Okay. Let's put like, raise your hands, close your eyes, look to Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, right here, right now, I release healing power of the Holy Spirit into this knee. Thank you for miracle, Father. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, right here, right now, in Jesus' name, we command this knee to be healed instantly, in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to move your knee up and down. Just go, this is the faith. Thank you, Lord, for healing it. Walk over there. Walk back again. Thank you, Lord. Just thank the Lord for the healing. How's it feel right now? It feels a little warmer. It's warmer? <laughs> From your hand. That's the Holy Spirit, brother. That's the devil telling you it's my hand. No, it feels good. Oh, well, the hand does get warm, but it's, it's warm. Lighter. It feels a bit lighter. It feels a bit lighter? Okay. Because my hands get hot when I pray. <laughs> hands can be cold, too. <laughs> I could put it on there and you could go, your hand's cold. <laughs> it feels good? Amen. Because yeah, I always get that. I pray and I go, oh, that heat's from my hand. Yeah, that's the devil. <laughs> and God's uh, healing it. So, all right, mate, well, just um, let us know how it goes. And I believe God's healing that and recovering it in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe that. And you thank him for that. Just keep thanking him. Amen. All right, then, we'll... Um, Hand back to Pastor Derek. He's going to share communion. And it's just 11.30, so we've got time to do that before we go. And uh, that'll be great. thinking about what the message might be for communion and um, Pastor Wayne um, said about a week ago that um, our, our faith isn't personal and he's true you know the scripture says that freely you have received freely give so in a sense you know, we need to be able and willing to give to people our faith or tell people about our faith and it shouldn't be something that we keep in, in, in to ourselves but what we're about to do is very very personal um, what you've got in your hands when you finally get it is the um, these are the symbols the, the elements of, uh, of, of communion they're the body and the blood of Jesus the broken body and the and the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Okay, now, Jesus didn't die for the Jewish nation. He didn't die for the Australian nation. He didn't die for any of those flags that we've got on the back wall. But he did die for you. And you. And you. And you. And me. died for you personally yes you yes you he did he died for you okay and if you were the only person in the world he would have died for you amen 
That's how personal communion is. It's a time where you can thank God that He died for you personally. And He died for the person next to you personally. And He died for your family at home personally. And every person you have ever known, or every person that's ever been born in this world, He died for personally. So it is a personal thing. And it, 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 if we think about that, it changes things. You know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's easy to sort of wash over it when you think, oh, well, he died for everybody. And you don't, you know, everybody is sort of like, oh, yeah, okay. It's, what is it, 27 billion people in the world or something like that? And it's, it can be easy just to sort of wash over it. And let it just sort of flow over your head. But when you think about it, it's me. Me. He died for me. And he died to take away all the sin that I've ever committed or ever likely to commit. Okay, And, and because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I stop sinning because that's when I stop sinning, I'll be in heaven. But he did. He died for you. And he'd do it again tomorrow if he had to. But he doesn't. Because he died once and once for all. And we do this in remembrance of him. We say, thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice you did make. I thank you, Lord, that you did it for me. And it takes on a lot more, um, how can I say, it, it means so much more when you look at it in that regard. I think it is. So if you'd like to stand up and we'll take the um, take your little wafer. And we just say, thank you, Lord. This is his broken body, or it represents his broken body. And, you know, just say, thank you, Lord, for, for doing it for me. Amen. to take the top off the I find it difficult at times but it's good so let's all take the cup the blood of Jesus that washes you white as snow so thank you Lord and just take it and be grateful hallelujah thank you Father hallelujah so um, yeah so if you need prayer, uh, Pastor Wayne and myself and Jack and anybody else will uh, only too happy to pray for you, with you, agree with you, uh, whatever you may have and uh, whatever your needs may be. God is interested in all of those things, okay? He's interested in you because he died for you. So if you need prayer, then yeah, just come on out. And uh, just um, if you know what you want prayer for, that's good. If you just want a general prayer, that's even that's good. 